Dearly beloved, brothers and sisters, friends and family, ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered here today to talk about the sermon. Now, if you were to ask the average person on the average street what they think about the word sermon, what would you hear? If you were to ask the person on the street, what do you think when you hear the word sermon? What are your memories? What are your images? What associations come to mind? What would you hear? Would you hear intelligent, provocative, holy, inspiring, challenging, comforting, healing, revolutionary, or would you hear other words? <laughs> We're gathered here because it's time to reclaim the sermon. It's a brilliant, primal art form. It's been around for years and it's taken a bit of beating recently, but what we need is a whole new generation of people who will embrace it as the beautiful, sacred, compelling art form that it is. And as things, come on. <laughs> As the world gets more Twitterized, I believe that what's gonna happen more and more is actual people gathered in an actual room with an actual person who has actual flesh and blood, who is actually talking in real time about things that actually matter, and people actually hearing it and saying, I was there, and it did something to me. And so as everything goes a particular direction, I am fully convinced that this art form is going to have a resurgence, because as it gets less, it's going to get more interesting, more compelling. As less people have faith in it, it's going to be all the more brilliant and counterintuitive and counterculture, and, and I believe you're probably here because you have that sense. For, for many people in our culture, let's be honest, the sermon is something to be endured. The sermon raises the question, when is lunch? <laughs> for many people, the sermon is simply something you get through. It's boring, insipid, lifeless. The last thing they would think of is, okay, whatever you do, don't miss that. Because someone's gonna throw it down and wherever you are on, it, it's going to be something. Perhaps uh, that's the worst thing that happens when it isn't any, it, I don't know what it was, I just, it was to be endured. For other people, the fundamental posture towards a sermon is it's to be evaluated. And so the two sacred questions are, number one, did you like it? I did, I liked it. You did, I, I liked it too. So-and-so didn't really like it. But other people do like it, they like stories. But my friend likes video clips. And some people like to take notes. And the sermon begins pretty much, do you like it? Or a bit like a sweater or a pair of trousers. Did you like it? And for others, it's not, did you like it, but it's, did they do a good job? How, how was it? I mean, you know, she did a good job. Yeah, but how did you do? Because <laughs> the point was to listen and then do something with it. Can you imagine? Think about hearing Martin Luther King Jr. and his dream speech, and at the end saying, well, I don't know, he would have been long, and I've heard some of those stories before. <laughs> You don't think about it and you don't think, I don't know, did you like it? No, the last category you put that in is that it happened and you either there or you weren't, but that was something. We're talking here about the greatest truths humans have ever stumbled upon. We are talking about resurrection. We are talking about a new creation bursting forth right here in the midst of this one. And somebody stands up in public and talks about that and the best way people can process it is, yeah, I think she did a pretty good job. <laughs> Perhaps we need to rescue people from this kind of perspective. And then for other people, their perceptions of the sermon is... And sometimes it's perceived that way because it's true. The sermon is pure propaganda. Let's be honest, some sermons are about telling these people what they already know and they already believe and they've already been taught to believe so they can continue to believe that they're the only ones who've got it. Are you with me? And so the truth is there isn't any room for this sermon to go anywhere because it's gotta fit right within this thing. In other times, let's be brutally honest, the sermon, we gotta get that building built. 
You with me? Come on. Sometimes the sermon is in the service of something else, and you're sitting there and you know it. This isn't a. This is about that, and not what I dream it could be or what we know it's supposed to be. Sometimes the sermon is just pure propaganda. It's just trying to get this group of people either continuing to buoy this is exactly who we are and what we're supposed to be doing, and there is no exploration, there is no discovery, there is no movement. It's about getting something else done, and you can smell it. Or I would argue your friends who haven't perhaps been a part of a church culture can smell it even better. The sermon is this beautiful ancient art form, and, and I believe you're here like me because you believe it's time for a resurgence, a reclaiming of this art form. Now, now this raises a question for me. Why would anybody want to give a sermon? Why would anybody ever been giving a sermon and thought, why in the world am I doing this? <laughs> this is insane. I want to talk about one of my first sermons ever. I was uh, 24, 25, and um, I was, uh, well basically somebody else that I was working with was asked to speak somewhere and they said no, and I was like the, but, but this guy will go. Um, <laughs> so, from the start, it was pretty sweet. And um, it was a revival at a county fairgrounds. <laughs> so, I mean, like, I'm just gonna fit right in, pretty much. Um, the only problem was about 13 people showed up. So apparently it was a revival, but nobody invited the Spirit of God. Um, <laughs> now, I have a, a Google image of the fairgrounds, because I need to lay out physically exactly um, who was where. First off, the, the 13 people who came, it was at a racing track. And this is the racing track, and you can see the stands right there, the white rectangle. Now, there was some sort of rule apparently agreed upon beforehand that the 13 people were not allowed to sit closer than 25 feet from each other. <laughs> so it was this big sloping roofed stands with like somebody there, and somebody there, and somebody there, and somebody there. Now, they did not put the stage right up towards the front row so that you would be close to the people that you're, oh, speaking to. They put the stage on the other side of the track in the infield. <laughs> they then apparently had concerns about weather or rain or hail because they put a roof on the stage, like a kind of tarp. But apparently hobbits put this tarp up because it was <laughs> like right here on my head. They then, on the stage, which was on the grass, May I remind you, on the other side of the racetrack, they put a large pulpit, like a large pulpit slash shield, <laughs> which I, I, what, what is this? Um, I, this is in between, I, yeah, this is not something I use much. They then, before I was to bring the revival message, had special music, and the special music was a keyboard player and a bass player who were leading singing, but partway through, for some reason, maybe because the stage was on the other side of the racetrack, the keyboard went out. So they led singing with a bass player. So, by the time I got up, I was like, man, the mood is set. <laughs> I gotta read from, I gotta preach from the phone book. I mean, this place is humming. <laughs> so I've done the, like, like, a, like two, three, four sermons in my life. I have my notes inside my Bible. I have, ex, uh, I have all sorts of outlines and scratchings in my notes. I walk up to the thing and it just, it doesn't feel right. And so there was some sort of fence they put up in the front of the stage for an unknown reason to this day, <laughs> but I wanted to be closer to the people. So I jumped off the stage over the fence down onto the track and got right on the track so the people are right here, and I opened my Bible and a gust of wind, <laughs> all my notes gone.
Have any of you ever tasted of the tree of the knowledge of naked and vulnerable in public? <laughs> It would be easier to be naked at that point because you could just run. <laughs> But you're left, I don't know what I'm to do. That, that story over the years has proven not to be an isolated incident. <laughs> you're up there, you're giving it everything you have, and yet there are these moments when you feel so exposed so vulnerable and so out there, like what am I doing? And all of a sudden, it becomes very, very lonely. How many of you have had this kind of experience? And, and in your moment of desperation, you look to see your spouse. <laughs> and they're either A, have left, <laughs> which doesn't help, or they just look down, kind of like you are on your own, <laughs> and we'll talk about this later. <laughs> Why would anybody put themselves through this? And, and my experience has been that Sundays come on a regular basis. <laughs> this beautiful, sacred art form can also be lethal. It can cut you, it can hurt. And you walk up like, okay, here we go. And you walk off like, what was that? How, how many of you on a regular basic experience um, pastor's hangover, which is you're tired and you find yourself thinking, I said what? <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason we put ourselves through this. Or, or I think of a couple of years ago, uh, at the end of a sermon at our church, I was sharing a story and it was a personal story And it was one of those things where you're sharing something and all of a sudden you discover there's all sorts of emotion down in there that chose this moment to come up and not the nine times you worked on it all alone in your office. <laughs> all of a sudden it came racing up and you had allergies and, um, and it was very, like a kind of overwhelming, oh my word, I think I'm gonna lose it, I think I'm choking up, I think, yep, I am full on crying. <laughs> And uh, so kind of the, the sermon, it, it didn't really wrap up, it kind of crashed and fell over. <laughs> and so it was, the, it was time like, grace and peace be with you, have a great week, see you next week, kind of. And so I'm still on the stage, sitting kind of, uh, there was a stool there, trying to kind of, what was that, what just happened, whoa. Kind of trying to collect, and a guy comes up, boom, he's three feet in front of me in seconds, and he says, dude, I gotta tell you about this album I bought this week. <laughs> Have any of you ever had this experience? Have you heard anything I've said? <laughs> Just give me one tiny fragment that you've heard anything <laughs> I said. And this gets worse the longer you've journeyed with a specific congregation because you meet up with wonderful people and they say something, and often it's not direct, it's somehow thrown out in the course of the conversation and you think to yourself, oh, dear God, I, they've been here for seven, eight, and that's where they are. Oh, have they heard anything? You pour yourself out. You're on this journey. You're engaging with the scriptures and you bump up against the limitations of what you're trying to do. Are you with me? It's like, oh. Or there's this one. I, I would call this one crickets versus that was the most powerful thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> you got this, th you know this thing. You are bring you're gonna open up a can on this one. I mean, this is gonna be like, you're gonna pull the pin and toss that and it is gonna be boom angels down through the roof. This thing is gonna be like people, people taking their wallets and emptying them out here and, and swimming to Africa to help people because it's that like media. I can't even wait for a plane. I mean, you, this thing, and then you give it and you just get crickets. And you were so convinced that was the, and then you f find out that it, it, 
It didn't, it wasn't, apparently everybody else wasn't feeling the same way. Or at the other end of the spectrum, you have this thing you've been carrying around. It's like, it kind of, you've been helping it along because you've, you've tried, you want it to fly and you've <laughs> duct tape wings on it and you've, you like, go, oh, you're great. You're, oh, you can, you, you can do it. And it's like when your kid in recreational basketball in third grade shoots at the wrong hoop and you're like, ah. Oh. And then afterwards, after you've brought this sick, anemic, <laughs> limping thing of a sermon, and you've presented it like, this is, I'm tired, I had a rough week, I had this, and this is what I got, and people are like, okay, that, okay, that, that was amazing. <laughs> and you, you're like, that was a homiletical piece of crap. That's what that was, okay? If there was the police, I would have been arrested for just bad talking, let among other things. And what happens is if you're in this place where the response of people, if you're, if you're working through how the response of people affects your sense of worth, calling, whatever, this, there is a sort of vertigo of I thought I knew, but at, wow, uh, Anybody know that vertigo? Like, I was pretty sure I knew how things, and you're thrown off. Like, if that's, if I, and there's this sort of humble, you smack up against the, the limits of your own, um, wow, I've got to figure out how to do this from a grounded, centered sort of place where I give these people my very best, and then from there, it belongs to somebody else. This sort of, God, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give them what I got. It's my best, and I'm grateful for this opportunity, but you're gonna have to help me sort through all of that. Oh, and there's this one, um, and, and this one. Oh, that sermon. It was so passionate. It was so creative. I mean, that, that was like the old Rob. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, 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 I think God loves him more, too. <laughs> Or, or this one, man, can't we do it like we used to do it? How many know that one? There's, there was a moment that was somehow, um, it had a sort of utopia, something about it, and it, if, it, can we could just go back to that? Uh, in our church, we began um, the first year of the life of our church by going through the book of Leviticus for the first year and a half, because that's in all the church growth books. And uh, <laughs> over the years, I, I just, Man, can't we just do like Leviticus again? Okay, you just said, can't we do Leviticus again? People don't say that. They don't say, can't we do Leviticus, period, <laughs> let alone again, okay? Uh, this sort of thing, and, th and those of you who, who have done this for a while, as you lead, and, and, and we're here to talk about preaching and teaching and, and, and giving messages, you develop a body of work. And so it isn't just now you and the message that you're giving in them, it's you and the message you're giving in them and a whole world of assumptions and expectations and experiences that are also in the room. And you have grown. You aren't who you were. You can't do it like you used to because you aren't who you used to be. And to go back would violate something. Uh, no, the Spirit of God isn't about endlessly camping out back there. The Spirit of God is about celebrating that, but transcending and including that, and then, and then being led along to the next place on the journey. And so there is this, this lethal thing, can't we, like the old building, like the old way we used to. And, 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 it, and they're just essentially saying, that shaped and formed me. That was a moment that was a key milestone in my, can't we go back there? But what it comes across is it really, really hurts. Like, can't we just do it like, that was like the old Rob. Oh, it's like getting kicked in the stomach.
And then uh, there is all of the various things that we are expected to balance perfectly and effortlessly. Like, be vulnerable and honest and personal, but not too personal, because this is a therapy session, and we need lots of Bible, but not too much, because it has to relate to what's happening in our lives and in the world today, but it can't be political, and it has to be challenging and deep and significant, and at the same time, easy for everybody to understand, and it has to be funny, but not too funny, because you're not a comedian, and you're a pastor, and while you're at it, mix it up and try new things, and don't get in a rut, but make sure to be consistent and talk about your own struggles, but not too much, because that's kind of depressing, and we, and we love stories about your family, but not too many, because that can be weird. Just be vulnerable and honest. <laughs> right? There's all of these balances that we are endlessly working on, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this, and the one thing that worked the first week of June, I mean, it killed. It was like, well, that thing, if you do it in the second week of June, will be so stale and lame that you, you so you're endlessly evolving and changing and working with it, and at the same time, there is this sense that there has to, there's a consistency, and you can't violate who you are and who they are and who, who your community is, and so you're endlessly navigating all of these various things. Notice Ezekiel, which you were all thinking, let's talk about Ezekiel, that's where we need to go next. Chapter four, take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. This is God talking to Ezekiel. You already eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. Eat the food as you would a loaf of barley bread, bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. You've had some weird outlines. <laughs> now what is this? Let's talk about this. What is the sermon? What is the sermon? Ezekiel has been told by, go and do this in public. Sounds a bit like a sermon. God says, I have a message for the people. I want you to bring it. So I want you to go and do this in public so that the people can hear and see the message I have for them. It sounds a lot like a sermon. You go in public and you do something. For many of us, we're so conditioned that you, you talk, but actually, like if you begin with the prophets, these are sermons, the sermon. Go and do this, and it's loaded with meaning and symbol and significance. The, the people knew what he was saying. It's just a little odd to us. Maybe you could say it like this, the sermon. There is a degree to which sermon is performance art. I mean, that's where its roots are to a certain degree. And what you will sometimes hear is, oh, no, 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 so-and-so, no, no, I'll tell you why people are coming. So-and-so, they just preach the Bible. Yeah, but lots of people preach the Bible and no one's coming. So if we stick with that sort of, oh no, no, it's just because they're sticking to the word, okay, then they're really good at sticking to the word. <laughs> Correct? And there sometimes develops this odd sort of like, you're not allowed to talk about the fact that that person, it's not just because they're preaching the Bible or it's not just because they're talking about Jesus, it's because they talk about Jesus in a really compelling way. And so what happens sometimes is the human dimension gets almost pushed to the side and ignored, but it's there and in the scriptures, it's really there. Sometimes the sermon, there's a, form, there's a sort of performance art. I mean, Ezekiel's roots there, what he does, that's, and that's Banksy. I mean, I mean, that's a gesture, a loaded gesture in public that people can infer from it what it means, and like, whoa, I can't believe he just said that, even if he didn't say a thing. There, there's a degree to which it's guerrilla theater. He sets up, he does his thing, and he's gone. And people, whoa. Something just happened, what was that? And you are discussing it and you are interacting with it and people are sharing their responses to it. It's actions that evoke. Sometimes the sermon, you are doing something and it is evoking something out of people. Perhaps you've had these moments when you were teaching or preaching or working on something and you realized what I need to do at that point in the sermon is, is I have to do whatever 
it is. I'm gonna talk about that all day long, but actually what I need to do is this. I need to wear that, I need to cut that, I need to glue that, I need to turn that over, I need to throw that, I need to invite that person up on stage, I need to, whatever it is. Uh, when you talk about the sermon as an art form, it's got as much in common with performance art as all sorts of things. And they talk about John the Baptist, what do they say? The brother brought it, the, 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 the words, the poetry, but what do they also always describe? What he ate, what he wore, he used the full package. Like people remember, because why? Because it made statements. Because was, he was preaching long before he opened his mouth. Like, oh, whoa, look who's coming. He's already made statements just by his presence. Or sometimes the sermon, next slide, in Acts 4, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What you find with the apostles again and again is they had been with Jesus. They saw something and it changed everything. They experienced something and they were never the same again. And so the sermon sometimes is witness. You have seen something and you have to talk about it. You have, if you don't share it, speak it, tell it, point to it, express it, preach it, you will spontaneously combust. <laughs> sometimes when you see a sermon, you're like, well, man, that thing did something, whoa. What you are seeing is somebody, they met the resurrected Christ. They saw heaven crashing into earth. They witnessed something and they had to share it. It's that feeling before you're about to give a sermon and you think, man, if I cannot wait to bring this. It's that feeling when you've got a sermon coming up and everybody you meet, you're like, hey, by the way, have you noticed in Lamentations chapter two, check this out. You're in a restaurant and you're drawing it on a napkin. You're jogging along and you're seeing people, hey, dude, I gotta stop and tell you this. This is so fresh, unbelievable. What is it? What is it? It's witness. I've witnessed something. I've seen something. I've stumbled upon something. I've discovered something and I have to to share it with people. If I don't, something is going to happen to me. It's like in there, like exploding. Sometimes the sermon is just, it's straight up witness. I met Christ in this person and I have to tell you what Christ looked like. Next, sometimes, or like Jeremiah 20, I love this, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And one of the things we're, we're going to talk about over the course of these uh, talks is exploring, setting up your life in such a way that there are actually things that are happening. They're like, okay, this is like a fire and I can't hold it in. The sermon, in many ways, has connections with performance art. The sermon, sometimes it's just straight up, it's got a dimension of witness. You've seen something and you have to share it. Other times, I like this one in Jeremiah 2, the prophet, is Israel a servant, a slave by birth? Why then has he become plunder? What the poet says essentially is, these Israel is God's son, God's people. God's people have been plundered, and this isn't what God had in mind. And so the sermon there, uh, next, the sermon, it's a reminder. Hey, 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 this, this isn't how it's supposed to be. This isn't what God has in mind. Sometimes we need that, do we not? Hey, hey, you, you have settled. You have settled. And that isn't right. That isn't right. I, I'm, I'm sure you're like me. You, you can think of people who, who sometimes need to be reminded, um, you're better than this be, because God is better than this. You are a child of your heavenly Father. You are loved. You are a new creation. Your identity is in Christ. Let me remind you that you are not a slave by birth. And so the sermon becomes this powerful moment of, oh my word, I have totally settled. Oh, I have sold out. And I've been jolted into this reminder of that this, no way. This is not what I set out to do. So the sermon becomes this beautiful of reminder of what could be. And sometimes, like in Mark, 
When Jesus, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. Sometimes a sermon is simply an invitation. Something big is going down, who doesn't wanna be a part of it? Sometimes the sermon is this big, wide, open, giant, inclusive invitation. Something huge is happening all over the place and everybody is welcome. Sometimes the sermon is witness. Sometimes it has this element of guerrilla theater. You set up and boom, you do it and you're gone and people are left with, whoa, what was that? I gotta wrestle with that. And sometimes it's an invitation. It's a, the word repent is the word return. It's an invitation to return to your true self. It's an invitation to return to the way of God. It's an invitation to turn from that way to this way. Sometimes a sermon is a fresh word. And with that, and this is key, the sermon often is implicit critique and we don't even realize it. When you stand up with a new word, You are saying something with that new word. You are making a statement about the old word. And what you are saying about the old word is it's time for a new word. Sometimes a sermon is the first punch and we don't even realize it. We've simply glimpsed something, Jesus' invitation, and all we're doing is trying to put words on this invitation. And actually there's a bunch of people going, hey, wait, 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 if I connect the dots, you're also at the same time in saying that's where we need to head, that where we're currently headed isn't where we ought to be headed. How many of you have had responses to your work and thought, where did that come from? I was just talking about this beautiful, compelling, amazing thing and found out that you you had actually taken the first punch and you'd swing and you didn't even realize it. How many of you know this thing? You were implicitly critiquing the current system and some folks have a problem with that. I don't know anything about that, but I've heard. (laughs) That sort of thing happens from time to time. And then, I love this. Isaiah 52, what is a sermon? Awake, awake Zion, clothe yourself with strength, free yourself from the chains on your neck, for this is what the Lord says, you were sold for nothing and without money you will be redeemed. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Now, who is Isaiah talking to? Babylonian exiles. Where is God in this? The Babylonians are winning. Look at the scoreboard. They crushed us. They killed off our leaders and they hauled a few of us away into slavery in Babylon. The Babylonians won, okay? Israel God, zero. Babylonian God, one. And now we're miles from home in exile and our identity is in question and the prophet says, your God reigns. What? What, shackles, okay? Our God reigns. Sometimes a sermon is a subversion. The story, the version is Israel's God has lost and the God of the Babylonians is one. That's why we've been hauled away to a foreign land into slavery. That's the version, that's the story. And Isaiah comes along and he presents a subversion. It is a version that says there are other versions and there are other stories. Sometimes what a sermon is is you are charging into a setting and saying, I know this is the story that everybody's assuming is the story, but there are other stories. I know everybody has said this is the story you live by. This is the narrative that you're supposed to line yourself up. There's actually, there's another narrative and it's better. And what you are doing is presenting a subversion. And that's why it's so dangerous. There's a reason why this particular version got ahead of steam and you are saying, nope. And you are calling it out. There's a better story. There's a better story. The sermon sometimes is just pure subversion. And then, uh, and I love this. I find this actually strangely encouraging. In Luke 4, and there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet. This is Jesus' first sermon in his hometown. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So Jesus essentially wraps it up by saying, by the way, in our own history, there were a bunch of people around in Israel who were sick, but, uh, but actually was a foreigner, pagan Gentile who was healed, which uh, is a bit of a dangerous thing to say in your hometown. 
All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. The response to Jesus' first sermon in his hometown is they wanted to kill him. So I don't know how your first sermon went, but if you lived, you know, I'll take it where I can get it. (laughs) Strangely encouraging. I got out of there. What is going on in Jesus' first sermon? I mean, it's brilliant. It's got all these layers and depth to it, but next it's... uh, It's just pure provocation. Don't think they didn't know exactly what he was saying. And they connect all of the dots immediately. And it's not like, you know what, in in small group later, we're gonna kind of discuss this and get back to you in some of the ways we're gonna apply it to our lives. No, they're like, (laughs) kill the preacher is pretty much how it ends. Then lunch. I mean this, Jesus is using loaded language and he's not backing off. And he's not saying, you know, we just gotta understand that Christians disagree and there are multiple ways to interpret this passage and we all just need to get under the Jesus tent and it's okay. No, no. He's going, here's what's going down. You're missing the point. And you claim to be God's people, but something's happening right under your nose and as has happened in your history, you may actually miss out. I mean, it is loaded, it is a warning. It is a warning, your actions are headed to a really dark, dangerous, destructive place, and I am here to warn you. It is pure provocation and warning, and they want to kill him. Sometimes the sermon is loaded with implications. It's loaded with warnings. It is, there are times when what the sermon demands is that you provoke. That's what's going on here. Sometimes it's like witness. Sometimes it's a subversion. Sometimes it's an invitation. Sometimes it's like, it's like guerrilla theater. You gotta do something to wake people up. And sometimes it's just pure provocation. At the Paris debut of Rites of Spring, there was a riot in the aisles. Some say that people were throwing rotten vegetables at the conductor. There are multiple accounts of exactly what happened that night, but it ended with fist fights in the aisles and a riot broke out because of the shocking, provocative, controversial nature of this piece of music. (laughs) And now we listen to it as a classic. There is always the chance that what was foreign, strange, and shocking may simply be a bit ahead of its time. And when you bring the fresh word, when you stand up in the midst of your community after prayer, study, in community you have discussed this and you bring a new word and you've got others around you who are resonating, there is a chance that it won't be understood. There is a chance that you're speaking something that some can't see. When you give a sermon, you open yourself up to misinterpretation and confusion, anger and ignorance and blogging and fear and (laughs) jealousy and opinions and evaluation and critique and agendas and baggage and convictions and projections, which is, this is way more about them than you. But at the exact same moment, you are also opening yourself up to the possibility of truth and light and hope and repentance, and desire, and compassion, and longing, and revolution, and confession, and inspiration, and comfort, and solidarity, and salvation, and resurrection. And when you do this, you don't get to pick one or the other. (laughs) You want the one, then you gotta be willing to take the other. And so part of what we're going to wrestle with, it isn't just technique and rhetoric and knowing how to memorize things and how arc and narrative and all sorts of things that we're going to wrestle through. It's also just coming to the realization if, if, if I'm gonna give sermons and not just putting in my time, but I'm gonna give sermons, which is I'm gonna give a part of myself, I am opening myself to up to all sorts of things. And that's just how it is, and you can't resolve this one. They tried to kill Jesus, and eventually they did. So that's strangely inspiring and also 
a, a kind of a bit of a bucket of cold water at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, so part of reclaiming the art of the sermon is being honest with ourselves. Notice Acts 17, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. When you give the sermon a mixed response may come your way. Some may say, seriously? Come on. And others may say, oh, could I please hear more? That's just what comes with the territory. I'm sure many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'd like to talk about Gore and Krop. I don't know if there's any Gore and Krop fans here. Gore and Krop is Swedish. In the early 90s, Gore and Krop decided I'm gonna climb Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. Everybody who climbs Mount Everest takes along oxygen tanks because you can't breathe as you get higher and higher. He said, I'm gonna do it without supplemental oxygen. But he said, you know what? People have done that before. I'm gonna ride my bike from Sweden to Mount Everest, climb Mount Everest, and ride my bike home. <laughs> but then he thought, I don't know, I think uh, I could make it harder. <laughs> Everything I need to climb Mount Everest, I'm going to bring with me on my bike from Sweden, <laughs> including food. There's actually one point when he's on the mountain and he is dying from malnutrition and someone offers him, I think it's a piece of cheese, and he has this ethical dialogue with himself about whether or not he could accept the piece of cheese. <laughs> In order to train for it, he moved out to a gravel pit, like you do, <laughs> and, and he would set his alarm for a random time in the middle of the night, and as soon as it would off, he would get up and walk 37 miles just to get his body used to, to doing things like this. <clears throat> At one point in the journey, specifically in Iran, he talks about the, the odd looks he would get and how people would throw rocks at him because he had to ride his bike through Iran and Pakistan to get to Mount Everest, which, I mean, you all know that. <laughs> if you do things that other people haven't done before, you may get a few strange looks. And that kind of comes with the territory. And part of reclaiming the art of the sermon is acknowledging when you speak a fresh word and when you put yourself out there, it's a bit like riding your bike across Iran. I was trying to figure out how I was going to connect those thoughts, but just take it, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> and oftentimes what we want is all that comes with speaking the fresh word, and there's a bunch of stuff that we're like, but I don't want that, and the problem is you may get a few funny looks. Some of them sneered, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead. And others were like, man, please tell me more. Why am I so passionate about this art form? And why am I so committed to doing what I can to helpfully maybe help others reclaim this art form? I, I think that uh, there's a reason why the Bible begins with a poem. And it begins with this poem in which, and God said. And then it's the speaking of all the ways the poet could have chosen to try and describe the creation of the universe. The poet uses this image of the divine speaking. I think it's because words create new worlds. You uh, had thought something for a while. You kind of knocked it around in your head. You never really shared it with anybody. You'd kind of been wrestling with it, and then you heard somebody say it publicly, and you learned that you weren't alone. You were thinking things, and what was happening in your spirit, in your heart, 
in your understanding of God, Jesus, resurrection, Bible, church, transformation, transcendence, what it was happening is you were coming to a realization that, that the story is even better and that Jesus is even bigger and that God may be even more mysterious. And you're realizing if I even whisper this to somebody, I'm going to get fired. And then you heard somebody say it publicly with a microphone on. And you realized that you're not alone and you may not be crazy. And if you are crazy, you have company. <laughs> and what happened? A whole new world got created. Or you've had this sense that there is a connection between this and this. You know, and this and this and this. You know there's some relationship. And then somebody said, boom, 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 boom. And stuff you'd been carrying around that was like, a friend of mine calls it tying the clouds together. Things that you had here and here and here. All of a sudden you went, that's it. And whole new worlds were created. There is a divine redemptive nuclear power in words. I acknowledge in the life of the church, you've got acts of justice, you've got counseling, you've got the real thing that runs the church, children's ministry. You've got <laughs> discipling people, you've got take, helping the poor, you, you've got all, and I realize that the sermon is only one part of a larger thing. We're talking about the sermon this time, but it's not because we think that somehow that's the only thing going. But the sermon has the power to create whole new worlds. Somebody comes in and they sit in the back row and they hear for the first time that, that maybe tomorrow doesn't have to be a repeat of today. And it's like the exact moment when they had to hear it. And they did. And everything changed and you can't explain it, and you can't plan it, and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But the, the rabbinic Jewish tradition, endlessly, you'll find endless discourse about the power of words. And I understand that actions, understand that flesh and blood and incarnation, we all, we're, all, we're all down with that. But, but the truth is, if you're like me, you have had moments when whole new worlds got created. Whoa, some, they just painted a picture that changes everything, and they did it in a sermon. So there's a sort of humility that comes with the sermon. It's only capable of so much. It, it's, it's bumbling, stumbling people like us trying to kind of put words on something we've seen, witnessed, experienced, discovered, explored. There, there, there is a, a should and must be a deep-seated sense of humility uh, and at the same time, a firm conviction that this, this art form, for one reason or another, throughout history, unbelievable things have happened because somebody was willing to stand up in a crowd and say, I've got an idea, hear me out, and unbelievable things happen. Now, our time together, uh, there'll be a bit of a progression I'll, I'll start theological and kind of talk about the foundations and the undergrounding. What exactly is the story that we're telling? Because I believe there are some deep-seated sort of things that affect everything else, and we intuitively pick up on that's a little bit different than that, and, but I think if you trace it down, you can discover there are some commonalities that drive everything. And then we'll move um, to kind of the conceptual. I, wa I want to talk about narrative and arc and tension and... Uh, what you can learn from mind mapping, storyboarding, sketching, Venn diagrams, all sorts of different things that maybe help get at how come some things have a certain thing and some things don't. I want to pull apart some, some things and um, hopefully that will help. And then um, we'll just talk about some very practical, I'll just work through some very practical things. Sometimes at these kinds of gatherings, I discover there are people who are like, okay, um, what's a commentary? Or I don't even know how to begin to memorize something. So um, we'll move towards some very practical, just share some things that have helped me with no sort of like, I just how to do it, but just here's some things that helped me. If that helps you, wonderful. And um, if it uh, doesn't, well, that's just um, what it is. And then we'll end um, with just some personal dimensions to the sermon and a couple things and one thing specifically that have 
uh, really, really, really helped me. So that's kind of a movement. Sometimes we get cooking at the, the theological conceptual and there are people who are like, okay, okay, I need nuts and bolts. Okay, I need like, the, and, and we will get there. It'll just take a couple days. My hope is that these talks simply, these are talks that start talks. For many people, their understanding of the sermon, which was rooted in an understanding of spiritual authority, was that the person up front had the last word. The leader was the one who could say, this is how to think, or this is how we think about this, and they ended the discussion. And for many people in, in our, our world, or our culture, for many people, that is their under, this person is gonna kind of fix it, solve it, lay it out there, boom, done. But, but I, I believe that what you find with Jesus, it's less about the last word, and it's a bit more about having the first word. It's a bit, it's a bit less about ending the discussion, and a bit more about starting the discussion. My understanding is that a great teaching, a great sermon, a great talk, what, what it, it gets things rolling. Now, it's not just a vague, like, here are 21 questions I'm kind of woo about. No, it, it's something was said, and it was defined, and it was clear, and it was compelling, but if it's true, true, period, like if it's true, then it's going to plunge you into all sorts of mysteries and truths and revelations, because if it comes from God, that's a pretty deep pool to be swimming in. So, so my hope is that these days together are um, in some ways a microcosm of, of, of what happens when people are being taught and when sermons are really cooking. It's just talks that start talks. And uh, I, I believe actually that if you can resolve a sermon by the end of the sermon, something is inherently flawed with the sermon. Because if the scripture is this movement from word to flesh. It's not just hearing it, it's hearing it and it becoming flesh and blood. It becomes incarnated. So it isn't just a word, it becomes a way. So there's this movement. And so the word starts something that then takes on flesh and blood. So you're talking about generosity, but it's not just talking about generosity. The, the hope and passion and dream and prayer is, is that people become living flesh and blood embodiment of generosity. There's a stream we can swim in and hopefully you'll hear some helpful things about, I think the stream, I think it looks like this, but you will take it and take it to your own context and there'll be infinite brilliant ways in which you'll figure out what it looks like in your particular word. So our, our, my hope and our hope and prayer is that these talks will simply start talks. And then one, one thought, uh, perhaps you came exhausted burned out, um, your screen is blank, I got nothing. Um, and, and my hope and prayer is that this uh, time together becomes a really holy, sacred time in which you uh, recommit to being the kind of person who, who it's not because you have to say something, it's because you have something to say. Um, my hope that for some of you, maybe as you make a commitment these couple of days, I will never give a sermon and just kind of get through it. I refuse to just give sermons. I'm going to get up there or grab the microphone or get in the group of students or whatever it is and I will not do that unless I am bringing my absolute best. Maybe for you it's some commitments along those lines. Maybe for you, you uh, are in a life where you have all sorts of things coming at you and you get these little tiny moments when you get to work on your teaching and then even those little moments get interrupted. It's like you fight for the space. And so maybe for you it's some resolutions about creating boundaries so you can actually put the time in. Um, and one of the things I'd like to explore is everyday sorts of disciplines that aren't 40 hours a week, that are five minutes here and 10 minutes there that have helped me with the just sheer accumulation of what's happening in your head and heart through the scriptures and life so you even have things to talk about. So we will work through all of that, but our hope and prayer is that you have a renewed sense of, I want to be the kind of person who speaks and I've got something in my belly, a fire, and if I try and hold it in, oh, I cannot.